Velkommen til frokostwebinar om urban klimainnovasjon, eller innovasjon til frokost, som Guru så fin formulerte det i siste nyhetsbrevet. For vi må det. Servere innovasjon både til frokost, lunsj og middag, der vi skal komme i mål med alt vi skal gjøre de neste 10-30 årene. For det er ikke småtteri vi står foran. Vi skal møte både klimakriser, naturmangfoldskriser, plasskriser og et par kriser til. Vi skal gjøre det rasende fort. Og vi må, der vi skal lykkes, også gjøre det på en inkluderende og rettferdig måte. Omstilling av løsningene vi velger må altså være sosialt bærekraftige. Og enda mer, det må være det både lokalt og globalt. Så heller det å puste med magen. Og del opp elefanten. Det vi skal snakke om i dag er urban klimainnovasjon. Det er selvfølgelig en spissformulering, for det er klart at innovasjon ikke bare må skje i byene, og at innovasjon også må skje på en rekke andre områder enn klima. Men klimakrisen er sentral, tett sammen ved så mye med artsmangfoldstap og potent med store sosiale utfordringer. Og det er også slik at mye av innovasjonen faktisk skjer og må skje urbant. Det er på mange måter at der tettheten er størst, og både utfordringer og muligheter og ressurser og mangfold og friksjon og uventet møte, og det kan det fort bli innovasjon av hvis vi griper mulighetene. Mitt navn er Stein Stoknes, jeg er faglig leder i FutureBuilt og møteleder i dag. Utgangspunktet for det webinaret er at vi i FutureBuilt ønsker å bli bedre på innovasjon i byutvikling og arkitektur, og bli et enda bedre innovasjonsprogram. Så da gjør vi som vanlig. Vi inviterer først en masse gode innovasjonsrode til webinar for å dele erfaringer med både oss og resten av innovasjonsbransjen, som i dag i hvert fall består av 300 stykker i følge påvelgingslista. Og i etterkant av webinaret så kjører vi workshop for å snakke om hvordan både offentlige og byggenæringer kan bli bedre på sårt tiltrengt grønn byinnovasjon. Og om hvordan FutureBuild potensielt kan strømlinjeforme innovasjonsprosessene våre, knyttet til forbildeprosjekter da, til gode for hele byggenæringen. Vi har et svært omfattende program, og vi har invitert bredt. Det kommer jeg tilbake til etter hvert. Nå vil jeg bare si at vi er svært fornøyde med å ha med oss i programmet både folk fra EU, fra C40, fra Oslo kommune, en hel serie med innovasjonsmiljø, forvalent FutureBuild-utbyggere og ikke minst det statlige innovasjonsvirkemiddelapparatet. Vi er også svært fornøyde med å ha fått på plass såpass mange gode venner som samarbeidspartnere på arrangementet. Innovasjon Norge er med, forskningssenteret Senn, Æra, Grønn Byggeland, og ikke minst Doga, som har åpnet huset sitt og holdt studio her i dag. Her kunne også pådriv vært med, som vi er ferdig med å rigge til et godt samarbeid med rundt innovasjon, i form av blant annet en nasjonal bærekraftzone i Hovindbyen. Det skal vi huske på neste gang. Rent praktisk så består programmet av fire bolker, og etter hver bolk blir det en egen Q&A-sesjon. Så da oppfordrer vi alle til å stille spørsmål underveis. Det skjer i Q&A på YouTube, og da er det viktig å være klar over at alle må helt inn på selve YouTube for å få tilgang til Q&A. Det holder altså ikke å se webinar i FutureBuild, eller videovindu på FutureBuild sin hjemmeside. Klikk dere ett hakk videre. Og så skal vi prøve å svare ut skriftlig fortløpende og underveis på samme sted, og i tillegg plukke opp en del av spørsmålene i Q&A-sesjonene etter hver bolk. Innovasjon, inklusiv både klimainnovasjon, grønn innovasjon og sosial innovasjon, oppstår gjerne i et samspill mellom myndigheter, næringsliv og sivil samfunn. Og myndighetene har en avgjørende rolle å spille. For innovasjon oppstår ikke et vakuum. Innovasjon trenger rammebetingelser som ikke bare muliggjør, men som aktivt pusher og stimulerer nytenking og endret praksis. Vi trenger politisk mot, tydelige visjoner og retning. Vi trenger et godt rigget virkemiddelapparat som støtter opp under innovasjon, og vi trenger offentlige aktører som tør å tenke nytt, ta plass i markedet og aktivt etterspørre nye svar på nye utfordringer. Og første bolk skal handle om nettopp det, om innovasjonspolitikk, og hvordan myndigheter, byer og offentlige aktører kan sette agenda, ny agenda, og bidra til helt nødvendig og radikal innovasjon. Så da skal jeg gå over til engelsk for en liten stund. Hello, Vienna and Maria. Are you there? I'm there. Hello. Hello, Oslo. I can't hear you yet, but maybe technicians can fix it when I introduce you. Uh, last time I heard Maria Vesliako speak was at a fuck-up night at Urban Future Global Conference. And the topic was how she, as a vice mayor of Vienna, when introducing new politics for green urban mobility, got a thorough backlash due to what we could call lack of uh, or insufficient citizens involvement. I know she's learned her lessons after that and gained important knowledge on how to drive change in cities. 
knowledge that's very useful now in her job as an advisor on urban transformation, including being a member of the European Union Mission Board on Climate Neutral and Smart Cities. A board that recently has launched the initiative 100 Climate Neutral Cities by 2030, with the aim, among others, to accelerate green urban innovation. So, welcome, Maria. I try, I try again. How does these mission boards work and how can cities become substantial innovation hubs? Are you there now? Yes. I'm there. Good Perfect. morning. Good morning. Nice to be with you. And without further ado, let me get started. Now. Yes. So you should be able to look at a wonderful image from Vienna, as I love it, from the wine hills. Um, and an image that actually stands for me for the diversity of our cities and the vision of making them climate neutral, of, of, of moving towards climate neutrality, of transforming them by 2030, or perhaps 2035, or perhaps 2050 at the latest. But what I will be talking about today is the horizon, the EU horizon mission, 100 climate neutral cities by 2030, which is not only a vision, it could be reality in about a few years from now. And it's about managing and planning the major urban transition that we need for this. Now, we all know we live already in the metropolitan century. Uh, cities are to grow from already more than 50% of the world's population up to 85% of the world's population by 2050. And the big question we have to actually answer, to give an answer to is, do we want managed growth or do we want mismanaged growth? Um, I personally believe that managing urban growth is an opportunity for transformation and we doing all, we're doing all this and planning all this for the backdrop of the Paris Agreement and the European Green Deal. Now, we are already in the second phase of the agglomeration. That means that cities occupy 2% of, of the planet's landmass, but they consume more than 65% of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of the global carbon dioxide emissions. There are high externalities, as we all know, predominantly rising very high and further rising costs for housing, um, two-tier labor market, sprawl, congestion, pollution, um, and as a matter of fact, high controversy also to urban growth already. Now, all these challenges call for action. They call for immediate action. And I personally believe that climate neutrality may be the key, the solution towards a better future. Um, this is what we're actually all talking about throughout the globe. We're talking about livability. I personally define livability as cities as places for life, places where we want to live and not where we live because we have to, places that are good for children, just to give you an example, places that give us access to nature, that give us the opportunity to have healthy lives, to move around freely. Uh, imagine what we all want for our children. This is actually what we all want for ourselves. And I personally believe we have to provide these qualities right at the heart of the city. We're talking a lot about climate neutrality. We're talking about inclusion. And yet again, that was just to give you an impression of what we are working at, what we all strive for, not to talk about abstract things, but very, very precise urban qualities that we have to provide for at the heart of our cities. So this is what, for example, a central shopping street looked like back in 2010 in Vienna. It could look like this, couldn't it, today? Well, it looks like this. This was a party day, of course. We don't roll out uh, grass each and every day on it. But it's just yet again to give us all an impression and inspiration of the types of transformation we're talking about in our cities. Now, 
Visions are beautiful, but from vision to mission. Putting a man on the moon again, it is said, and yes, climate neutrality is like in the 60s when the first people envisaged in the beginning of the 60s that they would like to put a man on the moon by the end of the destiny, and they did it. They focused their, their research and all their efforts towards accomplishing this mission, and this is where we stand again. We need mission-oriented efforts at the level of the European Union, at the national levels, and at the city levels in order to accomplish this mission of climate neutrality. And the cities are where we have to start. Now, the European Union has defined several mission areas. Uh, one of them is climate neutral smart cities um, and appointed boards to propose a design for each and every mission. I have been and still am a member of the board uh, for, for climate neutral smart cities. We were told to be bold and inspirational, um, to give a clear direction, to be ambitious, but realistic, to spark innovation across disciplines, to adopt and foster a bottom-up approach involving the citizens, um, and to foster citizen action. So not just uh, citizen consultation, but co-creation of the mission of each and every city. And once again, action. After working for several months, we proposed a mission, which is called 100 Climate Neutral Cities by 2030, by and for the citizens. Now, the elements of the proposed mission are a new model of city governance based on three principles, the holistic approach, a matrix for integrated and multi-level governance, and a deep and continuous collaboration between all stakeholders, a new role for the citizens, as I already mentioned, an active role, a climate city contract, that is a binding delivery mechanism of the mission to be signed by the mayor, but also national and regional governments and the commission, and a new integrated form of funding and financing. So the mission is, yet again, about systemic transformation and not just a few pilot projects in every city. Once again, active role for the citizens, the climate city contract. A new role a new concept for innovation, experimentation, and learning, and a new form of funding and financing. Here you can see a graph. I will be sharing this with you later. So perhaps you can take the time if you're interested to look more with more time at every slide that you find interesting. Here it is about the way the different tiers will work together and will hold different responsibilities for accomplishing the mission. And it's about the instruments that we need. So we need financial instruments, new taxation instruments, new regulation instruments, data management, procurement, research and innovation, cross-sectoral governance, citizen participation. Now the process, the application process is, takes place at more or less, or let's say the mission altogether let, takes place at three stages. There will be an open call. Cities can express their interest to be part of the mission. Already this expression of interest has to be worked out in each and every city with stakeholder, broad stakeholder and citizen involvement. Um, these expressions of interest will be evaluated. This results in a letter of intent now the real design phase starts where each city will design their own climate city contract, uh, which of course will be different from city to city because the backgrounds and challenges it's, each city is facing is very different. This will result uh, in a climate city contract once again to be signed by uh, all relevant tiers, and then the city will proceed uh, to uh, implement their mission. There are different levels of readiness, we should know. So this means that not all cities will be starting at the same point. Some cities have started already preparing and will be able to start earlier. Others will start later. 
and the Commission plans to install a platform uh, that will support cities, a kind of one-stop shop that will support cities uh, in preparing for the mission and also, of course, accompany their efforts all the way through. Um, the financial needs, well, here we can see the different types of investment needed, um, but what we can also see is that um, we have a return on investment by, uh, well, 31%. Um, this is according to a study from Material Economics. Um, here you can once again have a glimpse, catch a glimpse of um, the different sectors and the need for investment um, according to different se sectors, where we can actually see that it is transportation and buildings and energy use uh, that actually uh, will be the two main areas, but of course not the only ones. Um, when it comes to the investment uh, in terms of figures, well, uh, material economics has actually um, um, come to the estimate of approximately 10,000 euro per citizen, uh, which means, of course, huge sums of money. Um, and um, the, the Commission would want less than 10% of it to uh, result from public grants, loans, investments uh, that come from, from the public hand. 90% should be private investments. Uh, that means come from companies and um, citizens themselves as well. Um, there will be, of course, also a monitoring, um, including not only quantitative KPIs, but, and this is extremely important, qualitative KPIs, uh, and as you can see, citizen engagement, for instance, will be one of these uh, qualitative KPIs. And here you can catch a glimpse at the different phases of the mission. Uh, so um, we expect to be starting phase, the first phase, the call for expression of interest by the end of this year. Um, and we would expect more or less all cities to have started, to have gotten started with implementing their mission yeah. by 2024, 2025, perhaps at the latest. And um, this is just to give you an idea of the different Green Deal calls um, that are ongoing right now. Uh, so there will be cascading calls, many of them also uh, referring to parts of the mission, uh, but not only. And what I want us to all keep it back in the backdrop of our minds is that um, there will be also special assistance to, dis to um, design windows of financing for each city that will be participating in the mission, which means combining different calls, combining different grants, assistance uh, in negotiating, just to give you an example, with the EIB, which is anyway uh, projected to become um, more or less a climate transformation bank. Um, and when the, the climate city contract of each and every city will be uh, about to be signed, already the financing of the mission should be clear. Now let's take a brief look into managing this major transition. I think this means that we'll have to use new urban quarters as an opportunity for transformation and repair, or and transform historic neighborhoods. Um, I should also mention that when we talk about 100 climate neutral cities by 2030, we mean either a city in its entirety or perhaps a region where several cities work together or a city part. The, the threshold is 50,000 residents, but there is an option for countries that do not have so many large cities like Estonia or Malta, for instance, um, for them, 
um, this threshold is lies at 10,000 residents. But for Norway or Austria or most other parts of Europe, we are talking about approximately, once again, 50,000 residents. Now, if we look into regions, of course, there are several challenges we'll have to tackle. So looking into regional dynamics, I would say the most critical challenge is uh, internal competition, fragmented efforts, incoherent and conflicted messages. Um, looking into cities, we can see um, that there are challenges, for example, given retrofitted, retrofitting, um, so from corporate to individual, energy from local to systemic, transforming mobility from infrastructures to services, um, and economic, new economic focus from growth to circularity, functional entities from city to region. The cultural shift that we need, a new governance that we need, um, a new notion of leadership, and once again, financing from pilot to scale. So this leads us to a new paradigm from city to region, leaving antagonism behind and understanding regions as functional entities. It means thinking out of the box, integrated urban and regional, and regional planning, a new culture of cooperation and collaboration, and scaling up partnering for bankability within the region. It means innovative financing and legal instruments. Um, it means technical innovation, social innovation, sustainable entrepreneurship, um, governance innovation, and a new role for the cities and regions. It means the city as a steering entity, as a leading entity at the center of all efforts, being responsible for multi-level stakeholder governance and stakeholder management, because somebody has, of course, to take the lead uh, in order to be able to work together with multi-level stakeholders to create each city's um, climate city contract. And um, what is the state of play? Well, some have already started preparing for the mission. Example given in Sweden, vi the viable cities have already designed the first climate city contracts and would be ready to start. In Spain, uh, a, a city's innovation platform comprising 20 cities altogether has already started preparing. Uh, Austria and Greece, has uh, delivered the first roadmaps for cities uh, in order to prepare for the mission. Oslo, Helsinki, Copenhagen already have plans of becoming climate neutral by what, 2035, I suppose? They may want to just revisit these plans um, and turn them into climate city, de develop them further, transform them into climate city contracts. Um, and there are wonderful examples of how cities go about, in tackling, go about tackling different issues of what I've been talking about. So one wonderful example is the way the Oslo region um, has uh, managed to produce um, a joint Oslo brand uh, encompassing 78 municipalities altogether. Um, one second wonderful example is the relatively small city of Groningen that has gone the other way around, has actually subdivided the city in 130 neighborhoods and is trying to deliver um, district energy plans and more or less uh, climate plans for each and every one of these neighborhoods. There is the city of Ghent that has launched a huge project of stakeholder involvement, including the port. Um, in many cases, cities have very specific, very challenging, highly challenging local stakeholders uh, when it comes to climate neutrality. So they have started their efforts in becoming climate neutral, including yet again, um, the, the port. Um, they have already um, actually made available 30 million um, and, and made possible 30 million of investments uh, in, in retrofitting private homes uh, for 10,000 families. So, 
and they are about to design the first, the first circular, entirely circular neighborhood. Um, we have Vienna, for instance, where already 40% of, of the housing stock has been retrofitted, um, which launches systemically in passive house um, architecture, passive house standard, and where uh, we have already introduced um, energy zoning, which means that uh, according to which parts of the city one would like to make a new development, uh, launch a new real estate development, there are different types of, of energy, of renewable energy uh, that have to be used. Um, and we can continue. Uh, when we look into the state of play, we have different cities of the world also in terms of mobility, moving uh, towards systemic innovation uh, and towards mobility as a service. We have excellent examples from all over Europe of cities involving the citizens and encouraging and fostering bottom-up citizen action and not just co-designing, but really uh, fostering once again and supporting also financially uh, citizens' actions. Um, yes, I have one minute and I will be, I will be done in a minute. Thanks. Uh, and when it comes to the takeaways and into implementation perspectives, I would say the takeaways are predominantly first, first, uh, first and foremost collaboration once again, and the emerging public plural partnerships, uh, involving, uh, stakeholders from the quadruple helix. It means PPP is welcome again, because it means public investment and creating broad stakeholder platforms involving local businesses to uh, foster innovative solutions on a local level. It means governance innovation. Um, so involving stakeholders means new types of open governance and binding contracts. It means branding, inspiring branding, um, to inspire and involve. It means a new notion of leadership, especially collaborative, bottom-up leadership. Um, it means putting all these things together, letting them work together um, in order to uh, facilitate the mission implementation. Um, and what is very, very important to know is that uh, the call, the first call has already been launched to create a platform that will function once again as a one-stop shop for all cities um, that will be participating uh, to facilitate already uh, the first phase of, of the expression of interest. This uh, platform should start um, working uh, more or less in a couple of months from now. And I hope I have been able to make you not only curious, but to inspire you a tiny bit to be part of this mission. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Maria. Uh, very interesting and definitely very inspiring. And uh, at not the least, a very ambitious initiative. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, actually, the time is running a bit quick here. I have a few questions for you, but I actually don't have time to take them. But uh, uh, well, the one thing I was curious about was the last thing you mentioned there. Uh, how, how can we get involved uh, if Oslo or other Norwegian cities wants to, uh, wants to join this initiative and apply for some kind of uh, role in this, uh, among those hundred most ambitious, you said the, the application and the, and the platform is out and due to be operating in a couple of months. Is that right? I suppose so, yes. Yeah. This is right now the, the call is has been launched once again, so it takes a little while until they can start operating. But um, I would say that in case you are uh, interested uh, as a city, and I do hope so, and I think have to also say that you have uh, really you are in a very, very privileged position because you have many of the instruments that are needed to be part of the mission already in place. So just contact um, the, the commission, just contact us, the members of the board, um, and let us start thinking together and working together in how to prepare. Thanks a lot. I was uh, 
in, in, good inv invitation in the end there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure someone will reach out. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot from uh, Maria and Vienna. And then we have to push further, further on the program. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Have a nice day in Oslo. Same Bye. to you.